Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hope you all have had a good day. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Take a few, just welcome everybody here. All right. I'm going to start off taking prayer requests. Craig, good to see you in the house tonight. Yeah. Craig calls me and he says, Andy, I know I'm a prayer chain all-star. He said every time a prayer chain comes out, my name's on it. See, his goal, he said, is to stay off the prayer chain for a while. Well, we're all proud to see you. Amen. 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 So, um, Terry Stone had surgery today. I just got off the phone with him not too long ago. He's in pretty severe pain. So, he's going to be spending the night in Marion Hospital. So, if you could, just continue to remember Terry in your prayers. Pray God's touch upon him. Speaking of Terry's, I'd like for you to also remember Terry Linton. He's been battling a lot of pain in his back. And he's not doing real well at all. So, if you can remember Brother Terry Linton. I want to continue to remember Sue Miracle. And I want to tell you, Sue is at Liberty Village in room 112. Um, if you're interested in visiting, she'd be a great person to go see, and she'd love to see you, especially in the afternoon. If you'd like to send her a card, you can send cards to her house and her sister-in-law and make sure they get taken over there. And so um, um, I encourage you to do that. That's Sue Miracle. Also, um, um, Martha Owens had surgery yesterday on her knee. Not yesterday, Monday on her knee. So we want to continue to remember Martha. Pray God's touch during her recovery. Um, what other prayer requests do we have tonight? Bo Bonnie Gilbert. Marcel? Okay, remember Brother Kevin? No. Wade Underhall's niece, sister. Becky? Okay. Jack? That is one year old shots and having a reaction. Matt Ryder. All right. Jim's truck and also Matt Grider who's working on it. Yep, iron sharpens iron this weekend. And speaking of, that truck is leaving, or bus is leaving. They're not taking a truck. Um, Dan, what are you, 615? Okay. <laughs> I blew that, didn't I? <laughs> if somebody, okay, 545. If you're watching on Facebook, 545. I'm, I'm glad you... <laughs> <laughs> and I believe there's ladies breakfast this week too as well isn't there yeah. Barbara Colsey Remember Tabitha Carver. Shannon. Dad. 
David Manning, and I look back and I seen Fanning. And when I seen you, I seen Darlene. We need to remember her son-in-law, Eric Robeson, who'd been battling cancer. Had a chemo treatment again today. Didn't go well. And uh, we pray, continue to pray for him and that family. Rodney King. Grandchildren. Becky, how is your daughter? So really, we need to pray for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. We want to remember our world, our nation. We want to remember things going on in Ukraine. Remember our kids. And um, so let's take time tonight and pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, it is a privilege and honor to be in the house of God tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you are doing. And God, tonight we lift up these requests to you that have been called out. We know that you know each situation and you know each circumstance. God, I'm thankful to see Craig Baumgart here tonight. Lord, we consider that an answered prayer. And we thank you, God, for answering prayer. And we pray your continued touch upon him. Lord, I lift these requests up to you tonight. I pray, Lord, for Brother Terry Stone. I pray, dear God, Lord, a touch upon his back tonight. I pray a healing hand upon him. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you be with him during his recovery. Pray for Martha Owens. You give her strength during her recovery. Pray for Terry Linton tonight. I pray God a special touch upon his back. And Lord, help them to figure out what's causing his pain. Pray for Sister Sue Miracle. I pray God a special word of encouragement upon her tonight. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort her and, gra and, and go around her. I pray for Bonnie Gilbert and Barbara Colsey. God, you know those situations. And we pray, dear Lord, that you touch them. Pray for Kevin Miller. I pray, dear God, Lord, you touch his knee. And Lord, I pray, God, you'd be with him in a special way. Pray, dear God, Lord, for Wade Underhall's sister. Lord, you know that situation and circumstance. I pray for this little baby, Jack. I pray, dear God, Lord, you touch him. And Lord, help the doctor to figure out what his reaction is about. I pray, dear Lord, that your touch would be upon him and upon his family. I pray for Matt Grider tonight. I pray, God, you'd help him to feel better. I pray, God, a special touch upon him. I pray, God, for Jim's truck. I pray, God, that it'd be a easy fix and I pray Lord it wouldn't cost too much I pray for Tabitha I pray dear God Lord you uh, Lord we pray for good results for her I pray dear God Lord you touch her in a, and uh, Lord let them figure out what's going on I pray for David Fanning who's battling COVID we pray a special touch upon him I pray dear God Lord that you would be with those doctors and nurses as they work on them God I pray tonight for Eric Ropes and I pray dear God Lord I continue to believe and ask for a healing touch of this cancer I pray, dear God, Lord, you'd remove it from his body. We know, and Lord, I just know there's nothing impossible with you, and I hold out hope. Uh, Lord, as long as you're in the room, we know there's hope. And so, God, I pray you'd encourage that family. I pray, God, you'd give them strength through the midst of this. And Lord, I just pray, dear God, your Holy Spirit and angels would just comfort and be around them. Pray for Rodney King tonight. I pray, God, you'd touch him. Pray, Lord, for um, um, God, for Charlie and her blood pressure. We pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd be with, be with her. I pray for all those who are sick, or, uh, sick and afflicted. Pray for all those who are unsaved and just need a touch from God. I pray for the uh, upcoming events of the weekend, for the men who are going to the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. I pray, God, you give them traveling mercies and grace. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that it would be a great anointed day for them, be a life-changing day for them. I pray, God, that they meet with the Spirit of God. I pray for the speakers who will be coming. I pray, dear God, for the women's breakfast. I pray, God, they'd have a good anointed morning. We pray for our service Sunday. And Lord, your anointing be here in that midst. Pray God it be with us here tonight. And we just love you and praise you. And we thank you, God, for all things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen. All right. Frank, I've been inundated with candy tonight, but what's another piece, right? Thank you. Amen. All right. Um, 
So for those of you who are here, I'm going to tell you all this just so you know, okay? Because I know if you're here on Wednesday nights, you ain't no, no problem coming on Sunday morning, all right? So me and my wife are going out of town this weekend. We're leaving tomorrow, and we're going to, uh, we were supposed to, Dave, they'll be all right. These people will be here, trust me. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to go on our 20th anniversary trip in July of last year, and she got COVID and gave it to me. Um, and so we canceled, and so we pushed it to, to this weekend. So we're going to be gone tomorrow through Monday. Brother Dave will be taking our reins over. And so if you all have any needs, Dave's number is 922. <laughs> um, but I'm certain it'll be a good weekend, and we'll be praying with you all and expecting great things. Um, so you good, Dave? Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, trivia time. We ended in a tie last week. Um, it was a good tie, and uh, tonight I think we need a victor. All right, so um, I'm going to give West Side, East Side. I'm going to give East Side the first question tonight. Are you guys ready? For those of you who are just you're new to the room tonight, we're glad you're here. First of all, and uh, secondly, um, we um, play trivia to start off our services on Wednesday night. Um, and it's been neck and neck these last several weeks. All right, here we go. What book of the Bible tells the story of a mother who boiled and ate her son? <laughs> what book of the Bible tells the story of a mother who boiled and ate her son? Lewis just jumped out judges. Do you all want that to be your final answer? No, I said no. Hezekiah. It's definitely Old Testament. That would be a good surmise. Gives you a 1 in 39 chance. Hey, Tristan, could you run me a lens wipe up here? Going once, we're going with judges. The answer is Second Kings. <laughs> Second Kings, thank you, Tristan. Second Kings, chapter six. If you really like to read the story, it's actually a fairly good story. All right, zero to zero still. You ready, Maria? Did you? I'm glad we didn't start over here, I guess, you know. They'd accuse me of uh, they'd accuse me of cheating if I'd have flipped that. All right, here we go. Which king's army of 185,000 was slain in one night by an angel? Which king's army of 185,000 was slain in one night by an angel? Fitz? <laughs> I don't know his nationality. It doesn't say on the card. No answer? The answer is Sinisherb. Sinisherb? Sinisherb? Isaiah 37, 36, and 37. All right, zero to zero. Oh, well, this is an easy one. What Old Testament book prophesizes exclusively against the city of Nineveh? What did you say, Les? Jonah is correct. Oh, wait a second, it's not. Nahum is the answer. 
Nahum 1.1. 1, 1. I would have said Jonah 2. <laughs> Jonah, Micah, Nahum, right? Hold on a second. I'm going to go to the book. This message concerning Nineveh came as a vision to Nahum. Wow. Sorry, that was incorrect. All right. What did the relatives of John the Baptist think he should be named? What did the relatives of John the Baptist think he should be named? Yeah, we're going by the Bible. Zachariah, that's correct. After his father. All right, we're one to nothing. I'm sorry about that previous question. I would have said Jonah too. Right? How many years prior to Abraham's birth did Noah die? How many years prior to Abraham's birth did Noah die? Two. Two years. Two years. Genesis 5. Two years. All right. Chance to take a 2 nothing lead. Are you all ready? Who lost by Lot the chance to be a replacement apostle for Judas Iscariot? you move, Becky? <laughs> Matthias was actually chosen. He, he won. Barsabbas was the loser. All right, still won nothing. Hmm, this is a good question. What were the first four words God said to man? Go ahead, take a stab. Nobody else is raising their hand. You got it. Do you know him? Spit him out. <laughs> Be fruitful and multiply. One to one. All right, chance to take the lead again. After Samson's hair was cut, what injury was done to him? He was blinded. Two to one. Who led the assault of the Israelites on Jericho? Joshua. That's correct. Two to two. In Revelation chapter 8, what did the sea turn into? Blood is correct. Three to two. Man, we're on a roll now. It's like lightning round. This is kind of a tricky question, but maybe you'll get it. Who was the first wife 
of King Ashurus. Hold on one second. I'm going to give you a different name. Xerxes. Xerxes is going to be the other. Yeah. Who was the first wife of King Xerxes? King Xerxes. That's right, Vashti. Very good. Book of Esther. Three to three? Yeah. Three to three. It's your chance to take the lead again. How many books of the Bible begin with the letter A? Two is correct. Acts and Amos. All right, four to three. You got to have this one to tie, at least. They might still win. Under whom did Paul study Jewish law? Is that like a half answer, Bob? <laughs> You're going through the Rolodex, aren't you? Yeah. Now, before you say it, you might want to just bump it off somebody, you know. This is a big one. Gamaliel, but yeah, same thing. All right, for the win. Hmm. This will be a tough one. What Old Testament book? is the author of Hebrews quoting when he says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. What Old Testament book is the author of Hebrews quoting when he says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, now wait a second. Before you announce it out loud, do you want to bounce it off some people over here? Yeah, but you've got a whole, you've got a whole lot more brains up here too. Is that your answer? Psalms. Psalm 95, 7, and 8. Tie it in. Maybe next week. (laughs) Why would you lodge a protest? Because of the axe? (laughs) Um, My Bible just has Acts. My Bible just has Acts. <laughs> I'm going to go with a tie. 
This feels safer to me. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember last week we really kind of looked in the first three verses and talked about spiritual maturity, about growing as Christians. We talked about having a concentrated effort um, in prayer, a concentrated effort in reading our Word. How many of you tried that this week? How'd it go? Good? I encourage you guys this week, if you haven't started yet, start. Just set your phone down and pick five minutes and have a concentrated time in God's Word. And find out what he's what you're reading in a concentrated time of prayer, sharing your heart with God, praying for others, uh, seeking out God. Uh, the Bible says if we seek Him, we will find Him. And so I encourage you to do that. It will help you as Christians to be able to grow. Um, one of the greatest things we can see is growth. We don't want to be on just milk. We want to be on meat, right? Amen? And so tonight we're going to try to get all the way down through, I think, verse... 12, but we'll see what happens. It says, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but He was chosen by God for great honor. And you are a living stone that God is building into His spiritual house, spiritual temple. What's more, you are His holy priest. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As Scripture say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. And I think we even commented on some of these verses last week. Yes, you who trust Him recognize the honor God has given Him. But for those that reject Him, the stone the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's Word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for He called you out of the darkness into His wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even they accuse you of doing wrong. They will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. So as we read the book of Peter, we continue to see and remind you that he's talking to Christians who are scattered abroad. Uh, they're living in a time during persecution. They're living in a time when um, it's a hard world that they live in. They're troubled. They're facing different things. Chapter 1, he reminds them to look forward to their heavenly residence, to be heavenly minded, uh, to take pride in the salvation that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone has offered them. But he also, in chapter 2, starts to encourage them to the point of you can't remain where you are spiritually. You're going to have to grow. And the reason why he tells them they're going to have to grow because there's two types of people in the world. The ones who have accepted Jesus Christ and the ones who have rejected Jesus Christ. Amen? And when you look at our society today, we're trying to be, everybody tries to segregate everybody some way, some shape, some form, some fashion. Do you know how God's going to segregate us? In the lost and the saved. The ones who rejected Him and the ones who received Him. And so really, when we border everything down in life, while the world tries to break us all down into categories, God's breaking us down into one. You either know Him or you don't. And so He points out this expression. You think about all the ways that we're segregated today. All right, We're segregated by color. We're segregated by gender. We're segregated by race. Um, we're segregated over our political parties. We're segregated over um, the foods we eat. We're segregated over all types of different things. I mean, you can name a number of things. That's why when we're about to hit political season here in just a, here in just a couple months, I don't know about y'all, but this week political ads just started popping up. Text messages on my phone. Have you guys got those this week? And um, they're just hitting harder and harder, but more and more. And they're, you're going to see these polls that are going to come out. And they're going to tell you that you know uh, a man over 40 years old who has a beard. 
um, who has, you know, a limp in his right leg, he seems to favor this person, right? Because the more ways that they can segregate us, the more ways that they can alienate us. And if you remember about a year ago, we talked about Marxism and critical race theory in this room. And we talked about one of the points of Marxism is to alienate and segregate people as much as possible. God, when He looks at His people, He sees two kinds. One who rejected Him, and one who didn't. All right? And when the ones who didn't, they'll be, they, will be, um, they will be pushed away. Um, hey, Brother Dave, would you do me a favor? Sue Miracle's calling my phone. She's called like three times. Can you step out and call her? Um, and so... It says, why do these people stumble? It says that coming to Jesus Christ makes them stumble, all right? Or Jesus is a stumbling block to them. In verse 8, it tells us why they stumble. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. So why do people stumble? Because they do not obey God's word. That's why... We talk all, in, all the time about the importance of God's Word and knowing God's Word and teaching God's Word and building our foundation on God's Word and letting God's Word be our authority and from where we're looking at. Everything that we do in life should measure up or match up to the Word of God. Um, that's why it should become the most significant authority in all of our lives. Um, when we have an argument, how do we argue? From the authority of the Word of God. Um, when somebody begins uh, to say something, it needs to come from the authority of the Word of God. In every part of our life, we need to argue or look at from the authority of the Word of God. Um, because outside of that, does anything else have authority? Not really. No, not at all. It's all going to fall down. And so um, when we look at why people stumble, is because they fail to obey the Word of God, according to Peter. Um, coming to Christ requires things. Amen? It requires that we walk different, talk different, act different that we uh, speak different, that we spend our money differently, that um, we treat people differently. Coming to Christ has a requirement. And unfortunately, for so many people, Christ makes a lot of people stumble and fall. True? Um, they want the benefits, but they, want, they don't want the life. And so, Peter, he just, man, he, he's pouring it on here. And I really want to get to the part that I want to spend the most time on tonight. It says that they stumble because they do not obey God's Word for them and they meet the fate that was planned for them. Verse 9, But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you show others the goodness of God. For He called you out of the darkness into His wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you receive God's mercy. I love how King James Version reads it. And I want to read it, I want to read it just as, as they do. You are living stones, oh, excuse me. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of the darkness into a wonderful light which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now has obtained mercy. And so Peter calls them a lot of specific things there, but just look at those. A chosen what? A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. Um, those are pretty cool things to be called, but when we start breaking, breaking them down, a royal priesthood. Not a priesthood that is ordinary, but a priesthood that speaks for the who. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, royalty. It says you are a chosen people, a chosen generation. Um, it says that you are a, should be a peculiar people. Um, there should be something peculiar about us. We should not blend into the world. We should be opposite of the world, look different from the world. Um, and so he has all these adjectives that he describes us with. A royal priesthood, a peculiar people, chosen generation, all these types of things. And so when we begin to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how do we fit in with the world? The answer should be, we shouldn't. We should feel different. We should look different, talk different, act different, be different. Why? Because we're called to a higher calling. We're called to a higher calling. Um, have you ever like, saw weird people? How many of you like to people watch? 
One of my pastimes is people watching. I watch people all the time, every day. I watch how they act, how they walk, how they talk, the things that they wear. Amen? Um, I mean, you can just... Man, and I will tell you that some people are strange. Amen? It's like, are they a few french fries short of a Happy Meal? Or what's going on? Um, Typically in our culture... Trends are set. Trends are typically set by what we claim to, what the world claims to be as the most popular people. All right. Now, these po- most popular people, typically their morals are fairly low. All right. They could be celebrities, sports stars, authors, news anchors. In this day and time, they call them social media trendsetters, um, and they set these fads or these trends, and everybody sees it and they say, "Well, that looks cool. That looks great." Um, and ultimately, we see the large people flock that way. Whether it be by the way we talk, the way we dress, the things we listen to, the things we watch, the things we partake in, every one of us probably in this room are guilty of it in some sense or another. Because the world is wanting to set the trends. But Peter was looking at all these Jew, these, these Christians that were scattered abroad, and he knew that the trends that were being set. And he wanted them to know that in the place they were, in the location they were at, in the people they were among, they should be different. They're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. They have an identity that is based on God. And all of us, all of us, man, we need to have an identity that is not based on the things of this world, but that is based on God. When people speak of us, one of the greatest compliments they can share, they can talk about you, is that you're a God-fearing person who knows the Word of God, who speaks of God, God should be a topic of our conversation, a representative of Jesus Christ. Um, If somebody calls that, that's a holy person. Praise God. That means you've walked different. You've talked different. You've looked different around them. Somebody, you know, somebody says, well, man, all they all want to do is pray. Praise God. At least that you're setting an example, a trendsetter. Um, They might call you modest or reverent. Praise God. You want to be a peculiar people amongst this world. The last thing you want to do is blend into this world. One of the things um, years ago, and I don't hear this much anymore, but when Stephanie and I started homeschooling the boys, I was talking to one of my friends in Nashville, um, and he's like, aren't you worried about socialization? And I was like, I, at first I was like, yeah, I guess I am. Maybe I need to socialize. I didn't know. And, and they're like, he was like, I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? Um, no, I'm not worried about socialization because the people we our socialization tries to be like the most is the people that we don't want our kids to be like amen i mean the most popular and followed people in the world curse all the time um last sunday evening there was a half a game and a halftime show right that millions and millions and millions of people watched um that glorified shooting police officers right i mean as christians should that be our our comparison? And the answer is no. And so the world will set all these trends and all these things and we think, well, we can like this here. We should be a different and a peculiar people. Amen? I mean, what if, what if people think that you're strange? Good. Good. It's a breath of fresh air. Amen? Um, frankly, it's good to be strange. Amen? I mean, not like the world strange, like the people you might see at Walmart strange, but strange. But with all that being said, really the part that I'm going to get to comes next. It says this in verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you. I warn you. King James there in verse uh, verse 11 Dearly beloved, I beseech you. Notice the sternness in the way that it changes. I warn you. I warn you, he says. As temporary residents and foreigners. As temporary residents of this earth and as foreigners of this earth. To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. That wage war against your souls. Notice the fullness of it. It says in King James, it says, 
I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Um, Peter, later on in chapter 5, he's going to talk about your adversary, the devil, walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Um, but here, he talks about abstain from our worldly desires. All of us live where right now? In the flesh, all right? Um, Dave is teaching a class right now. Dave, how do you say it? There's two natures, and you were telling me, you were preaching at me earlier today or last night. What were you saying? About the old man being dead, but the new man being alive. But what did you say was still there? The two natures were still there. The flesh was still there, wasn't it? Um, and so we live in our flesh. Do any of you in this room ever have battles with your flesh? Amen? I do. I don't know about you all, but I do. Um, I've never met anybody who was honest who didn't have trouble with their flesh. All right? In fact, we give the devil credit for the things that our flesh deserves credit for. Right? Um, the devil, he's not the most powerful being. God is. He can't, even be, he can't even be multiple places at one time. He's limited. And so a lot of times we give Satan credit for credit he doesn't deserve. Some of the biggest problems that we have when we fall into sin has nothing to do with Satan. It has to do with who? Us. With our willing to be disobedient to God, uh, with a willingness not to um, live in the Spirit of God, with a will willingness not to grow in the Word of God, Sometimes it's just pure ignorance. We just don't know because we fail to learn. But here, Peter issues this warning. I warn you, brothers and sisters in Christ, do not give in to worldly pleasures which wage war for your soul. I mean, secondly, I want you to just point out the, 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 the words that he uses, all right? They're not hoping to get your soul. They're not, maybe by chance will get their soul. He uses the term wage war. Wage war. Notice the heaviness of that statement. Wage war. If you were to go out tomorrow and your neighbor was waging war against you, would that be bad? Yeah, in fact, we're talking about like Russia and Ukraine going to war right now. We're not talking about them slapping each other on their hands, are we? We're talking about them firing missiles and bombs and shooting at one another and tanks and all these things. Waging war, the ultimate outcome of war is what? Death. Death. And so here he paints this picture when he's looking at it. Look how, how, how he says that. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. Wage war against your very soul. One of the things that in the last six months I have realized more and more dealing with people and looking at certain situations, there are so many things that are fighting, that are fighting for the Christian's walk with God and it feeds off of their flesh. It feeds off of their flesh. I want you to know now that we live in a different world than we did five years ago. We live in a different world than we did ten years ago. And there are more tactics and more antics that feed to the flesh Almost everything that we have feeds to our what? To our flesh. All of us in our life, what do we want? We want comfort, right? We want to feel good. We want to feel pleasure. We want to feel happy. We, we want to be a fool. We want to, we want to have all the good things, right? Um, if it don't feel good, we usually don't partake in it. Amen? Amen? If we don't enjoy it, we turn it off. We want things and we want it now. We live in a world that wants things right now. Um, one of the things that I've, I've I mean, is it, just battling. When you start to look at the flesh, the, the things that flesh wants more than anything, obviously in our nation and even in the world, sex is an all-time seller. Right? It always has been and it always will be. And Satan, while he ain't everywhere, he knows the tactics to use. And so that's why on every television show, on every commercial, you see sex presented to you some way, somehow. Amen? Um, the things that are acceptable like in motion pictures now and even on some of our cable channels, years ago you would have to go to a special section in a video store to see those things. Now they're radically portrayed. Used to, pornography um, was bought at a convenience store behind a rack. Now it's accessible to five-year-olds on their telephones. Everywhere you look, sex sells. 
The reason why sex sells, the reason why sex is pushed is because they know, Satan knows, that it will tease our what? Our fleshly and our worldly desires. And I want you to know that everywhere you look, there's a fight. It destroys marriages, it destroys lives, it destroys families, it destroys churches, it's destroyed pastors. Why? Because it's waging war against your soul. Secondly, you think of the things that we push on flesh. Um, If you did pay attention to the Super Bowl last week, um, I was reading an article this week, there were 17 beer ads during the Super Bowl. Why? Why? Alcohol, because alcohol sells, right? Because it makes you what? Makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. I'll say it again. I've never in my 15 years of pastoring had somebody come to my office, knock on the door, sit down in my office and say, hey, Pastor Andy, I just want to tell you, alcohol's been so great for my life. Nobody's ever came and said that. Now, I have had people come and say, Andy, alcohol's destroyed my marriage. Alcohol's destroyed my family. Alcohol killed my child. I have, I've had all those. But I've never had somebody come in there and say, hey, I just want to tell you how great it was to just be drunk. Nobody has ever said it. But I want to tell you, Satan knows what feeds our heart and soul, don't he? Amen? Amen, Andy. Amen. And I will tell you what he does is he seeks to destroy using the things that we long for. Amen? Using the things that we long for. He sets trends that feast on our flesh. That's why we have an appearance crisis in our nation today and even in our world today, don't we? Um, We have an attack on young men and young women. Um, They they get their identity based on whether they're called pretty by the world, whether they fit or not into the ideal woman or the ideal man. But the Bible says this before he ever starts telling them, he he starts telling them what their identity was. Remember what he said? You're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen generation. You're bought and paid for with a price. You're a peculiar people. You're the crown and glory of the creation of God. Why? He's wanting them to know their identity is in Christ and not what the identity of this world makes them out to be. Amen? And so, so many times this world is waging war on our souls. And you may think, man, I can tease and I can play around with the world, but I'm going to tell you from 1 Peter chapter 2, He urges you. Do not mess around with the world. Do not mess around with worldly ways. Be different than the world. Walk different than the world. Talk different than the world. Act different than the world. Why? Because just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's moral. Doesn't mean it's honorable. Doesn't mean it's glorifying to God. And I want you to know that as men and women of God, Peter chapter 2 specifically tells us to watch out for worldly ways Because that worldly ways are out to destroy our walk and out to wage war upon the very souls which Jesus Christ died for. Amen? Think of the picture. One is Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. His blood shedding on our behalf for all of our shame, all of the things that we've done wrong. And the other is the world coming to try to take and regain what Christ had died for. You see the contrast, how they're battling? Everything, everything feeds into our souls and our flesh. And I want you to know that it should be guarded more than anything else. Amen? I will go ahead and add another token upon the fire, log upon the fire. Not only should we guard our own souls, but we should guard the souls of our family. Amen? Husbands, wives, we should guard each other. We should challenge each other. Our children, we should care about our children. We should care about what our children watch, what our children see, what our children talk, what our children wear. All those things. Why? Because it matters. Because Satan is waging war on their souls. Well, I want them to fit in. You don't want them to fit into that. You want them to fit in with God. You say, well, that's a narrow-minded view. The, God, the, the Word of God is very narrow-minded. Always has been and always will be. And I want to tell you, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be different. Amen? Isn't it? I'm going to tell you one of the most refreshing things in the life is when somebody, man, lights a fire for God and takes a stand. Isn't that good? You know, you ever listen to sound bites of different people? I love sound bites because 
They don't require a lot of my attention. And I love, you know what the, 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 the most entertaining thing is? Is when two or three minutes go and somebody takes a stand to get something that we know is wrong. This speaks pure truth. And I'm going to tell you, the world hates it, but it feels good to take a stand. It feels good to seek out God. It feels good to be different. It feels good to be different. I mean, it's refreshing. And he says to this, he says, listen, I, I just want you to keep away from your worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Wage war against your very souls. And I think of it even further. Um, you know, I, I have a 17-year-old boy and a soon-to-be 15-year-old boy. Like men, I call them young men. Caleb has a beard. I guess he's not a boy anymore. Um, but one of the things that um, Stephanie and I, we've often prayed is, is, is more than anything, we want our, our sons to be godly men. Um, they're, you know, Caleb, he's talking about college and what he's going to do and where he's going to go. And Dad, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, dude, you do whatever the Lord leads you. As long as you're living for God, you could be a ditch digger. I don't, I don't care. If you're living for God, I'm for you. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so when, when we start to see it, I, I have witnessed over the last three or four years the attacks that take place specifically on youth right now. And I realize, one of the things I realize is when I look at my son who has a beard and is six foot tall and 200 some odd pounds, and I look at him and I think, man, he's a man, but I want you to know that spiritually, he's still a kid. And the world, they want to ransack him. They want to ransack him. And we're putting things in their hands, I'm going to tell you, we're putting things in their hands that if they're not filtered, it'll kill them. It'll kill them. We're putting them in situations that they never should be in. You want to know why? Because they're not mentally or spiritually ready to handle it. Do you know how long it took Paul to go onto the mission field? Three years. Before he ever went anywhere, he sat and studied and learned every single day about the things of God. For how many years? For three years. You know, we often say, well, our kids can be a shining light. I'm certain that they can. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, let no man despise them because of their youth. But I'm going to tell you, until I feel like my boys are ready, I'm going to be standing in front of them. Amen? Why? Because the world's waging war for their soul. And they're feeding off the fleshly lust that they know all of us have and that all of us are guilty of. Amen? So you may say, well, I'm not really facing war. I guarantee you somebody around you is. Somebody around you is. Um, and here's the thing. We shouldn't just live in the war. We shouldn't just look and say, man, they got their leg blown off. Right? We should help our wounded. Amen? You help our wounded. Um, we don't leave wounded there. We go after them, right? Hey, come over here. Let's get you where it's safe. Let's get you to the fort. Let's get you to the camp. Um, and as Christians, we do a lot of just leaving when we need to be taking them with us. Hey, you need to come with me. How do we come with us? I'm glad you asked. Because we're going to finish this up here, okay? So, be careful, it says, to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. So does it matter how you live around people who are ungodly? Yeah. And he tells them, make sure you live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will honor God. They will, they will give honor to God when He judges the world. And so, in essence, what He says is you can have an effect upon the world by being different. Amen? You're, you can have an effect on the world by being different. You can have an effect by speaking the truth when nobody else does. Um, how many of you guys like those uh, Kendrick Brother movies? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, one of my favorite ones is the Courageous movie. Do y'all remember Courageous? It's about the police officers. And they have this uh, Hispanic guy that becomes their friend. Y'all remember this Hispanic guy? He's like the snake king in the back of the cop car. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, go watch it. But anyway, he's try he don't have a job. He's unemployed. The main character hires him. He does a, builds a shed for him at his house. And then he knows a guy 
out of all things, a thread factory, which I didn't even know there was such a thing, but apparently there's thread factories. And so he becomes this, uh, he, he, he's working at this thread factory, and after he works for a little while, the boss calls him in, and the boss says, I want, I'm looking for an inventory supervisor. All right? So he says, I want you to go home and pray about it, but he says, I just want you to know, he said, tomorrow, he said, there's going to be a delivery come in. He said, you're going to receive pallets, seven pallets, but I want you to say that you only got six. And so he goes home and he thinks about it and he prays about it. He talks to his wife and he realizes, hey, he's wanting me to lie on this report. And even his wife is saying, well, it's probably not that big of a deal after this guy, after all this guy owns the company. And he comes back in the next day. He has a meeting with him about 10 a.m. And he walks back in. He sits down and the boss looks at him and says, okay, what'd you decide? And he says, hey, I can't take the job. He says, it's too much. I, I, I have to live honorably before God and that would be a lie and I can't lie. And he's expecting to get fired, and the boss looks at him and he says, Thank you. He said, I didn't, was running out of patience. He had already interviewed four others, and they were willing to lie. Listen, it takes a lot to stand for God, it doesn't take nothing to not stand. There's plenty of people who won't stand. Be a peculiar people. Amen? All right, we are dismissed. Love you guys. Hope and pray you have a great week. Bye, Facebook.